Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, episode 56 on the 26th of the 11th, 2012. Tonight we're talking about creating miracles and building hope, a renaissance story of a derelict town of Hamburg. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, where we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action. Good I'm evening, everybody. I'm your host, Talina Simpson, and with me is, is Chris Dykes. Hey, hey. Hamburg is a derelict little town in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, a bit of an eccentric village with gogos and dune runners and a claim to fame being a tapestry. Right, with us is Andrew Hoffmeyer. Uh, How's it evening, yeah. An educationalist by training 17 years in the, in well the I field. I lectured for 17 years. Lectured yeah, for 17 been years. In, been all okay. Long. And for, in, for t- the purpose of tonight's talk, a trustee of the Kais Karma Trust. And uh, from what I, I gather, as, to, as an outcome of this trust, there is a, a tapestry which is on its way to the Smithsonian or at the Smithsonian at this point. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, we've got a. a a number of artworks that have been used to mm. to open HIV and AIDS conferences all over the world, and what appears to be a great example of a community project that seems to mm. be achieving spectacular results. So, so, so we thought it'd be a cool talk yeah, topic no, just to. So Andy, you actually bought a property in this little town of Hamburg ten years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean it's, it's actually worth going back into the history of the thing. I mean how it all started. Yeah, uh, that, and I'd love a description, like. Yeah, no, I'll give you a, a three-minute one. And the village, yes. <laughs> All started in 2001, and doctored artist Carol Hoffmeyer went there for a weekend. Literally, she said, let me go and see this village for a weekend. That was in 2001, and she's still there. Hamburg was, was originally a German settlement back in the 1800s, hence the name. Then it became a sort of a, a whitey holiday place. Mm-hmm. had a, like a hotel and all sorts of things. And then it was handed over to Siskai, um, the, the former so-called ho- homeland. And sadly, it was it was just, it just went to wreck and ruin. So, mm-hmm. when Carol arrived there, um, and I a, a year later, part, most of the houses didn't have roofs. The windows were gone. The doors were gone. The roads were almost impassable. But the biggest thing was that it was a village without hope. Um, the in, totally impoverished population, ninety-seven percent unemployment, ravaged by AIDS. So it was a a very sad place, but mm-hmm. at the same time, an incredibly beautiful place and a place ultimately of great hope. And Carol just felt she couldn't leave, that she had to stay and try and do things. And slowly, something grew into this thing now, which Mm -hmm. is world famous, the Kais Karma Trust. And we started with her paying people to pick up litter. And then from that, she said, well, now we must get checkers, plastic bags, and make hats. So she got some women from Lesotho to come and teach the mamas there how to do hats. And soon East London didn't have any checkers packets in the stores because people (laughs) came to steal the checkers. And there was not much of a market, so... Her husband used to buy all of them and take them back to checkers. But (laughs) from there, it became more serious. And uh, the the, the two main dimensions to the... It's it's multifaceted. We have about seven different aspects of the project. But the main ones are art and health. And so we have our own wellness center. We have field workers who go into the villages to help people. We have buddy systems to help people remember to take their ARVs. We do our own what, ARV what, just to buddy, mm. Just to clarify, I mean, a buddy system, One what is that? One of the biggest ch- challenges with ARVs is once you're on them, you've got to stay on them. Mm. And if you miss out, you relapse. You can relapse sort of further back than you were. And mm. that the drug you're on becomes ineffective. So mm. that it's, it's quite a, a critical thing. And what we found is using things like cell phone technology, SMS, uh, and also field workers who would go into the villages and just encourage people and help those Mm. who were really quite ill to make sure they took their their ARVs. So the health thing has grown enormously, and it's quite interesting from a funding perspective because, you know, that's always the the really the hardest thing with the trust Mm. is we're on about a 10 million a year budget now is that people want to put money understandably into things they can relate to and things that are sexy, as we call it, like, Mm. you know, sex appeal Sex appeal sells in any of these projects. And uh, HIV. Art, people say, why are we doing art? That's the biggest question. Mm. And there are two reasons, quite profound, is that Carol's view is that the only way people will want to get better is if they have a reason to live and Mm. a sense of pride. And the art has done that to the most astonishing degree. Mm. So um, funny if you mentioned tapestry, the, the altarpiece is the most famous one, I think called the Kaiskama altarpiece. 
and that year I opened the World AIDS Conference in Toronto. It's been to UCLA, it's been to State Cathedral, Washington, New York, London. So it's, it's really has become quite a, a world famous work of art. Mm. Just um, to, you, yeah, know, you talk yeah. about the, the meaning. Um, in one of the videos that, that Carol has linked to the, mm -hmm. linked to the trust, she comments that there's actually very little point in making somebody better if they can't earn an income. And I find that quite a, quite a hard statement mm -hmm. to make, but one that held, that held a lot of kind of meaning, a lot of the substance. Um, and so she was saying that any treatment mm -hmm. needs to be holistic and include mm -hmm. family, it needs to include income and ultimately yeah. meaning. And if we compare that to Viktor Frankl, who was obviously um, a survivor of Auschwitz and he subsequently created a school mm -hmm. of psychotherapy called Logos Therapy, meaning meaning, mm -hmm. he was saying that uh, it's a peculiarity of man that yeah. he can't survive but for the future. And so it seems that there's some very mm. strong parallels between... In a way, it works in two directions. Is they won't people, the, 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 it's obviously a generalization, but people will be more likely to want to get better mm. and to you know, follow a healthy regimen and take the ARVs if they have hope. Sure. But equally, once they're better, if they haven't got a job, the hope mm. might fade. And so while job creation has never been a sort of explicit um, objective of the trust, we do employ, uh, probably it, it, it changes, you know, over period to period, but sort of between 150 and 200 people, wow. mainly unemployed s mothers, um, mm -hmm. single breadwinners for their families of five, six, seven. And they, we've trained them in art. All of the art's made out of materials. So that's stitching um, for the Bayer tapestry. We actually brought out stitches from France to teach mm -hmm. them the historical Bayer stitch. Um, felt work. And we get an incredible um, source of volunteers. Um, at any one time, we'll have 10, 15 volunteers okay. from all over the world. Wow. Um, be it in art. We do capoeira dancing for the youth. It's a Brazilian martial arts dance. Okay. We've got early childhood education, food and gardens projects. Yeah. So it's, it is all of it, very multifaceted. Okay. S and the income, I mean, th is the income being generated by the project then creating a, a sort of... You know, yes and no. Most, most of the income comes from funders, one okay. has to be candid. The, the only aspect of the project that brings in its own money is the art. But mm. even that, we, you know, does need some cross-subsidizing. Okay. There are two dimensions to the art. The one is a straight commercial enterprise where the mamas make, um, you know, cushion covers and wall hangings and bags and mm. all sorts of things, but beautiful. Mm. And all with the theme of, the, almost all with the theme of, of the environment, the Nguni cattle, which are so important to the Corsa, you know, the air area, the, the, the estuary in Hamburg. Mm. And those are exported all over the world. They sell to tourists who come to Hamburg, um, other outlets in South Africa. And then every second year we do a major work. And those are the, the truly sort of profound experiences. Just to give you a taste of a couple of mm, them. The first please. was the, the Kaiskama Tapestry. Now, the Bayer Tapestry of 10, well, was celebrated the Battle of Hastings, 1066. And Carol felt we needed to celebrate the history of the Tosa nation in the Eastern Cape. Mm. And so she set out to create a modern Hamburg version of the Bayer Tapestry, okay. of, you know, nearly a thousand years ago. Yeah. And that was the biggest tapestry in the world at 72 meters. Okay. And we got I going. I think you mentioned that it was on the, in the Guinness Book of Records at one point. No, or I think we've ever applied for Guinness. Was it not Guinness? It, it was somewhere. Okay, now. so it was just, yeah. just recognized yeah. as the biggest. Okay. And it tells the history of, of the Eastern Cape from the sand to Mandela. And the main focus, though, is the, the, the cattle killings. Okay. Um, the, the, there was a, this, this young prophetess called Nkwasi, and she had a vision that if the Corsas drove all their cattle into the sea, the British would leave and the cattle would then emerge again from the mm. sea. And of course the prophecy never came true, so the tapestry makes it come true. Mm. It's, it's the Nguni cattle everywhere, they've come to life again. That is now hangs on permanent exhibition in parliament. Okay. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's 142 meters, I think, or 124 sure. meters. So it takes a while to look at it. So each of the major artworks references an historical work. The, the most mm. famous one, the, the, the Kai Kaiskama altarpiece, relates back to a German Isenheim altarpiece of about the 17th century that was designed to help people cope with the ravages of the plague. Mm. And so we did the uh, sort of Kaiskama altarpiece to help people cope with the ravages of, of HIV. The Guernica you mentioned, that was Picasso Spring ex expressing his outrage at the uh, bombing of Guernica, a little village in Spain. And this one, I mean, it's quite hard hitting, expresses outrage at the government's failure to deal with social development and uh, AIDS and so on and so forth. Mm. So each one references these historical things. And the next year, we're putting on an opera, Faust. 
it's the government selling its soul to the devils. So I mean, <laughs> so I just, it's radical, yeah. Just want to check. So I've I've heard of this little little village, you know, Hamburg. You said it was a place of no hope, and you know, a couple of years ago, and and so is it Carol, is it mm -hmm. right, went there, and and you've got involved in that, and this trust has developed, and so you're making all these artworks, and that, and you now. Um, Supporting a hundred people through through kind of jobs. How big is the actual village? I mean, all the all the people uh, that are being impacted yeah. from that village or in the surrounding areas. We cover the surrounding areas. The, the trust essentially stretches up this dirt road, so it's it's at the end of fourteen kilometers of dirt, which we love because it keeps all the lines out. Although it, you know, obviously, it's got to get tarred sometime, otherwise you can't develop the place well. So you've got Hamburg right on the mouth of the Kaiskama River. Then a couple of kilometers up, you have Bodium, and then Bell, and then you know, the next one, there are about five villages. And so we try to spread the work of the trust so that we create employment in all those those mm -hmm. areas as well. Um, but yeah, Hamburg is a tiny village. It's uh, there's sort of two parts of the old town, which probably mm -hmm. has, I don't know, 60 houses, okay. some inhabited, some derelict, and then a very beautiful location. Uh, but, well, I support a lovely woman there called Jacqueline Zikala. And she has five acres overlooking the sea. I mean, I'd kill to have that property. So, and they, there's a bit of subsistence farming and people run their own and goonies mm. and so on. Very traditional and they want to stay that way. And, and um, like donkey drawn carts. Well, yeah, the streets, you've got cows, donkey carts, goats everywhere. Um, and then the only other thing in the town literally is a trading store and a pub. That's it, uh, which I can live with. <laughs> but it's exquisitely beautiful. It's it's a particularly beautiful sort of just from an environmental perspective, yeah. stunning, stunning place. So why why do you think this your your Kaiskama project has been so successful? You know, it it does it goes down to a wonderful community um, who want to make who want to make a difference to themselves and others. Mm. But Carol surely that starts yeah, with something. I mean, Carol, one has to say, I mean, she's an absolute, she's created miracles. Mm. Uh, she's a visionary. She's committed. I mean, I fear always, and I mean, I have an art with her. She'll just fall down dead. I mean, she works 18 hours a day. Mm. And she's received, I mean, she hates acclaim, but she received a lot of recognition. In August, I think, she was made an honorary member of the Royal Society of Physicians for her contribution to medicine. And that is an incredibly high honor. Mm. And she's constantly on TV and so on. She doesn't like it, but we keep pushing because she is the brand of the trust. Absolutely. But the success would come from that. Lots of volunteers. We started with a few local people who just come there and say, I want to do something. Helen Fossler, South Africa's top floaters, came there for a weekend and said she wanted to do something. That one I tried to talk her out of. She said she was going to teach the little kids from the village to play the recorder. Um, boy, have I ever eaten humble pie. <laughs> They've now got a 55-piece <laughs> orchestra. Um, and they'll be back doing the backing for the, the yeah. opera for the next year. Um, absolutely fantastic. Okay. They're doing incredibly well. Quite a few now have got tertiary qualifications in, in, uh, in music. And then increasingly, the, it got known internationally. People mm. would come to South Africa. They'd hear about Hamburg and this miracle that's happening there. They'd go there, go back, tell their friends. So as I mentioned earlier, usually a dozen or so volunteers from everywhere. Canada, Americas, Brazil, the whole of Europe, China, Taiwan, Thailand. Um, and they come usually for a stint of three months to a year. Okay. We have a French couple who arrived for three months, I think six years ago. They're still there. Um, and they just come to, to try and make a difference. So that also has, has, you know, I think contributed hugely to the success. Um, very loyal funders, very loyal supporters. Mm -hmm. um, and often doing wonderful things. I mean, there's this guy who heard mm -hmm. about it and he said to us, he's not into charity, but he's a very successful British businessman. He owns the Lonely Planet Guide and all of those things, where he publishes them. So he went home and he phoned his 25 best friends and he said, we're going to walk to the source of the Kaiskama River and to the mouth, which sounds like a long walk. What had happened is we drove them all the way <laughs> up to Hogsback and they walked to the source. Then we drove okay. them to a village down the, you know, along the beach. Yeah. And they walked. They had what they said was the big, most fun they've ever had over a weekend. They were artists and poets and businessmen and bankers. Yeah. They partied nonstop. Um, we had a lovely dinner for them right up in the location, which was a first for them. Oh, and the Duke of Buclue as well, which I must tell you about. And they left a check for one and a half million rand. Wow. Um, that their friends had all, you know, they'd all got themselves sponsored. Yeah. So we get lecker things. We've had Pedal for, Pedal for Petty, which was a group who pedal from Hamburg to Cape Town. So you get all these people who want to become part of it. The question so it seems was like what, it's what a really multifaceted approach. Massive, yeah. 
and, and lots of uh, sort of innovation and, and, yeah. and the more people being involved, the better. Mm. And, and using the spirit of collaboration. And you never turn down an offer of help. Yeah. Anything. You just say, come, let's do it. Yeah. So even if it's a wild idea, like let's start a music academy, <laughs> you do it. Yeah, and absolutely. I've got to tell you about the Duke of Clue because yeah. that's quite a fun yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. We hear that this Duke's coming out to Hamburg. And I the said, Duke well, of where? He's, oh, I, 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 that's too hard to remember. His name is Richard John Walter, Walter Montague Scott, <laughs> the 10th Duke of Clue, the 12th Duke of Queensbury, Knight of the British, it goes on. He's yeah. the biggest private landowner in the United Kingdom. Okay. He's got more land than the Queen, which is quite something. Yeah. Anyway, so he arrives in Hamburg to commission a tapestry of one of his castles. He's got the biggest private tapestry collection in the world. He's mad about tapestries. And okay. he heard about Hamburg. Yeah. And to his credit, came out here. So I phoned a mate and I said, you know, what do you call a duke? They said, well, sir, you know, we're normal. He was the most ordinary guy. He said, really? you know, I'm Richard, a charming guy. Took him up to have uh, dinner with Mama Eunice in the location. I mean, he'd never had an experience like it. And he commissioned two tapestries of his castles, which would now hang in his private gallery with okay. alongside Renoir's and everything. Yeah. Uh, the joy is that the mamas love interpreting things. So we've got Scottish castles with fish from Hamburg and the estuary f suddenly flowing past these these Scottish mm. castles. But apparently he loves them. He says they're absolutely delightful. Oh, that's great. Eh? So we've got a lot of characters. You know, one of the, the, the stories I loved was the, the mama who literally had bumped into Richard Gere at one point. She pushed him out of the way. She pushed him out the way. This African others as she put them. <laughs> no, that's a lovely story. They were... Uh, at the opening in Toronto, we always yeah. make sure that people from the village go. You know, yeah, to yeah, yeah. These fantastic places. Isn't that a, an incredible way of s of sharing the stories yeah, yeah. and creating the inspiration and the driving the hope? Than we can, yeah. yeah. And Eunice is just astonishing. She's one of our HIV/AIDS counselors. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this this huge thing. Well, one must remember this altarpiece is seven meters wide and five meters high, and it opens layer after layer. And we always make sure that there's a choir or some music at the opening. Anyway, at Toronto. Eunice saw there was this guy looking very closely at the tapestry, I mean at the altarpiece. So she went up to him and literally looked down. And she, she, this is how she puts it, so forgive me. She says, and I looked down at this African udders of mine. She speaks with a Cape colored accent. We have no idea why. <laughs> and I looked at this oak and I decided, no, he's not a match for these. So she pushed him out of the way with the udders. And Cal rushed over and said, you know, do you know who that is? And so Eunice said, no, I don't. And she said, well, it's Richard Gere. You know? So who's he? <laughs> the famous actor. She says, I don't care. He was getting in the I way. I don't care. <laughs> he was in the way of the other people. <laughs> Interesting why Richard was there. His brother David um, is the is a professor of um, in the AIDS research unit at UCLA yeah. that yeah. co-founded the virus. Okay. And he came to visit recently. He's become a huge supporter of the trust. So. Uh, so, so with that that link to HIV AIDS, uh, what is the the impact that these tapestries and that it is making, if, if, if that makes sense? So besides mm -hmm. the buddy systems and in helping people in the community take their antiretrovirals and that, and it's then a good question. tapestries going all the way o or, you know, around the world, and I've heard that you know it's to open mm. you know conferences and that. It, it does many things. The one is just in that we have this art project. We've got lots of people employed who were previously unemployed. But it's not just financially that they've gained, the, the, the sense of self and the pride. I mean, there's some beautiful film um, uh, sort of inserts about Nozetti, who used to be what we call a muscle mama. And these were women whose sole source of income was Perlebun poaching and in very dangerous conditions, collecting Ali Kriakul, which is a, a giant cockle, and mussels and oysters. And they go down at low tide and come back and sell these things. And that was her sole source of income. Mm. Um, we probably made 20 rand a day. And she's mm. now, as she says, and now I'm an artist. Um, so you've got the sense of pride, a real sense of belonging, mm. um, a sense of pride, not only in yourself and your art, but in the whole community. Mm. So it's, it's had, I think, a, a very, very profound effect on people's lives. I think there's any doubt about that. Mm. Um, and on the people who visit there, I mean, it's, it's a moving experience to, to be part of the whole thing. So if we if we start looking at the the, 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 the South African circumstance, and we start mm, saying, mm. you know, I've got this incredible project that, that literally, as you said, is changing lives, and we've also got hundreds, if not thousands, of people mm, that mm. are wanting to be involved or are involved in different community projects around the country and potentially even in in, in a wider scope. Mm, mm. How can the learnings and how can the models and how can the sort of like the impact be? Be, be shared or, or at least um, be made available mm. or 
how can people use the, the knowledge or the experience that you guys have had? You know, that's a hell of a nice question, Chris. We do do a lot of partnering. We're very into that. Mm. So we collaborate with other NGOs, okay. particularly in art, um, and not just in South Africa, in Kenya, um, other African countries overseas. Okay, We've got a link with the grannies of Hamburg and the grannies in, in Canada. So Facebook um, is becoming a phenomenon in, in Hamburg as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we've now got an IT center. Okay. Well, in Lela. Brilliant yeah. IT center. You know, we've got about 10 terminals. We've got Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, but yes, your question, we collaborate a lot. Um, always open to ideas, suggestions, yeah. and also always open to visits. A lot of people hear about it and say, can I come, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, and volunteer for six months so that I can take what I learned back to my community. Wow. So about a youngster hitchh hitchhiked from Limpopo. He'd heard about the project, mm -hmm. just arrived there. And there's always accommodation. I always make a plan. Yeah. And uh, so the, obviously the wider any good we can achieve can be spread and replicated, yeah. Yeah. the better. Absolutely. It's ultimately what, obje what the key objective yes, is. No, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it might be slightly off the, off the topic, mm. uh, but uh, it's, it's what's always stayed with me as a, as a story was a guy called Gerald Darrell, who you mm. guys probably heard mm. about, my family and other animals. And, and he created a system where internationally people would come to his Jersey Trust to learn yeah. the best practice yeah. in animal husbandry yeah, and, and uh, looking after animals and that mm. type of thing. And at one point, they had somebody contact them via a letter out of Kenya yes. who was responsible for millions upon millions of square kilometers of uh, land. Mm -hmm. And he was driving a conservation project on $10 a day across the entire project. Good. And he arrived in, in Jersey, yes, completely sponsored, yes. of course, and, and was able to, to, to take back mm. a whole serious amount yeah. of knowledge. And he was able to motivate um, communities throughout this land on better, on better game management and yeah. the importance of ecotourism and that type of thing. And for me, that's, mm. that's visionary. You know, it's the Wonderful kind of thing that can, that can mm. fundamentally mm. impact on, on people's lives and, and the environment and, and that type of thing. And I guess... That's really what um, what we're wanting to focus on tonight, as a sort yeah. of as an outcome, yeah. if you like, is what we can do yeah. to to help drive this kind of change. You know, it's great. I think th there's so many different types of ways one can get involved. Mm. You know, individuals might say, "I just want to make a difference," but I'm not there. They can obviously always contribute to the fund. Yeah, there might be people who'd like to start something like this, can come and spend a week with us and and gain the insights and training and all that sort of stuff. People with existing NGOs who want to collaborate, um, it's it's very much a, a sort of a shared process, mm. like open learning, etc. Mm. Um, so yeah, there, there's any number of ways, and and we've got a good website with links to all the movies. There are quite a few films have been made on, mm. on the Kai Skarma Trust, and I urge also everybody to look at a thing called the June Runner because that's just yes, astonishing. I wanted to, to um, end off on, on that. Yeah, story. Yeah. Of, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll leave it yeah, to the end. It's quite a guy. Okay. Well, we've got about three or four minutes left, or about four or five minutes left. So, so tell, us, tell us then about the, the June. June Run is an, an astonishing man called Vuyasi Lagaba. And when we arrived in Hamburg, he, he was, he was, he ran all the time. He used to run yeah. in a, a red party dress that he borrowed, I think, quite forcefully from his sister. <laughs> so people saw him as a bit of a nutcase. He, he unfortunately used to be a security guard and was quite severely damaged in a, with, in a beating. So he okay. was ordered. But he's an extraordinary guy, and, and his real talent is at night when it rains, sometimes God speaks to him okay. and says, go out on the dunes and make art. And he goes out in the rain, in the pitch dark, and he runs on the dunes. And in the morning you come out, if you're lucky enough to be there when he's yeah. made art, yeah. and you see these astonishing artworks. And they are totally astonishing. Oh, they are. Yeah. And, if the and he does it in Google pitch darkness. It. I mean, it's yeah. just... Anyway, so we made a movie of them. He agreed mm, to I run in the, the daytime. The clip. So if anybody's um, interested in having a look at those pictures, what uh, what website can they, the what link can they look at? I think the Dune Runner is linked on the Kai Skarma website, or they can just email me, andrew at bused.co.za. But the website's Kai Skarma, K-E-I-S-K-A-M-M-A dot org. Mm. And there you'll see links to all the different facets of the project, to PayPal if people want to contribute, um, links to the movies that have been made, TV shows that we've been on. So there's quite a, a wealth of stuff to get one's teeth and ears and eyes into there. Cool. And so this, uh, this June runner, you say he is inspired by God. Yeah. And he wakes up and he goes out running and mm. creates these, these incredible um, yeah. art pieces. I mean, and we can and they're, they're quite big. They're yeah, they're huge. Uh, so with his footprints in the sand, yeah. leaving, leaving a, a pattern And we've now dunes. created a network with, for him. Yeah. So I was listening to 
702 last year, and Jenny Chris Williams had a guy on called a land artist, and he was fascinating, a chap called fun, somebody fun him over. And uh, so I Googled this guy and sent him an email. The heading was a pillow land artist question mark. And I mm. said, hi, you know, I don't know if, if this is what a land art is, but I think you may find this guy interesting. And I sent the links. And he wrote back such a sweet thing. He said, Andrew, yeah. thanks. Wow, this is absolute <laughs> amazing. Anyway, he then yeah. put me in touch with the other land artists. It's, yeah. it's an amazing field of art. Astonishing. It's all ephemeral. Yeah. You make the art and it'll disappear. That's the whole idea. Yeah. And they mm. now want to run the next international land art uh, week, which they run every second year in okay. Hamburg, to kind of celebrate Boya Day. Wow. So, uh, so we've been able to get him. I don't know if he even saw himself as an artist. Also a brilliant musician. Mm. Um, he plays guitar. Old Glosser style guitar that's really dying out. And so mm. if you watch the movie, he does the backing music for okay. it as well. Yeah, the Very dinner cool. is phenomenal. Lovely, <laughs> lovely person as well. Yeah. Mm. Stunning. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So then maybe just to end off, if you could give someone one reason, I mean you can ask us plenty, but if you just sum up what for you in, in your heart is the reason to go visit Hamburg in South Africa. Hey, it's so hot. It's my soul space. I think there, there's probably three things. So one is three. Okay, okay, okay. one is three. Uh, so I'm not getting biblical, <laughs> but let's do it. Let's First do it. is it's natural beauty. It's an astonishing. It's, it's a very soulful, very therapeutic place. Second is the wonderful community there. Mm. Um, really, really, mm. there's a rich sense of cultural history there and a desire to retain it, which is unusual. Mm. They don't want to modernize. Mm. And the third is to, to visit the trust because that's, that's really something special. Great. Well, we'd love to hear more about we'd your hear more. views on this and what you think of the Dune Runner and the tapestries and, and how art can, can give people hope and you say purpose and a place in the world. And so of course, if you're, just before we finish up, of course, if you're wanting to find more about the, the opera planned as, a, as, a, as another option linked to the trust. Hmm. We're still busy writing it, but it's on track. The major works are always launched at the Grandstand Festival. Okay. So uh, it'll be on there next year. Cool. I reckon. Great. Great. So, so tweet us on LT Possibility. And then next week we'll, we'll explore another interesting topic. So for me, Talana Simpson and all of us here at Let's Talk Possibility, have a great week and go share the possibilities. Great. Night, everybody. Thanks very much.